we'll resume um, our meeting and next we'll be hearing from uh, Northwestern Medical Center. And I see Mr. Wright is here with his team. Um, so Mr. Wright, I'll have uh, Mr. McCracken swear everybody in and then we'll have an opening statement um, from you and your colleagues. And then uh, Director Lindbergh will start going through the um, uh, slides to review. Um, and I think Mr. Sutter will be leading some of the staff walkthrough of the factors and uh, the questions. So I'll turn it to uh, Mr. McCracken and thank you all for being here. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair Foster and uh, good morning. Um, Mr. Wright, who from the Northwestern <clears throat> Medical Center uh, is gonna be presenting and answering questions today? Mr. McCracken, I've got John Cassavant, who's chair of our board of directors, myself, Stephanie Bro, our Chief Financial Officer, Devin Batchelder, who's the Manager of Budget and Decision Support, um, and then we also have Dr. John Menadeo, our Chief Medical Quality Officer, Dr. Don Craigle, our Chief Nurse Executive, and Jonathan Billings, our Chief Operating Officer. Those folks will be answering questions, um, uh, potentially, anyway. Um, thanks very much. I will uh, swear you all in at the same time. So if you could all raise your right hands. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. I do. I do. Great. Thanks very much. And I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. McCracken. Chair Foster, Sarah, um, let me just start by saying we really appreciate the wonderful support and collegial partnership that we've had with Sarah and her staff during the budget process. Um, it's really been uh, quite nice. Um, communication has been really strong. Um, Chair Foster and members of the board, uh, as well as the healthcare advocate, we greatly appreciate your uh, the dedication of your service to the state of Vermont. Um, I'm gonna uh, quickly hand over the opening uh, part of our quick presentation to our board chair, Mr. John Casaban. Thank you, Peter. Thank you to the board and thank you to Chairperson Foster for joining our board meeting a few months ago. Um, I'm going to be pretty brief. Um, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about our board and a little bit about what we're doing, and then I'll turn it back over to Peter. Uh, I've been on the board at Northwestern Medical Center twice, uh, starting in 2002 for the better part of the last 20 years. My dad started practicing medicine in Franklin County in 1954. Um, the hospital provides services to me and my family, to our community. Uh, on our board is the chief of our medical staff, um, a, a retired lawyer, a retired hospital CFO, district director for the Vermont Department of Health. Um, we, we're pretty we're pretty deep in our knowledge, I think, and very very committed to Northwestern Medical Center. Um, our administration under the board's direction has, has developed a budget this year that I think is both sustainable for our board or for our hospital and responsible to our community and to the healthcare system in Vermont. We're very aware of our place in that community in Vermont, not just in Franklin County. It's been a year of transition. Um, we uh, we're in a new a new era, kind of post pandemic, and a time of endemic. Um, and we have luckily enough to have great leadership stability. Uh, most of them around the table today, or maybe all of them around the table today. We are working hard, as I said, to be responsible to us and to the system. And in that way, this year we've reduced our number of travelers from 53 to 32 and hope to, in the next uh, six months, reduce that again significantly. That obviously affects our cost um, greatly. We've invested in, in a system to help recruit and train nurses, kind of an earn to learn program. There are two of them that uh, allow our um, staff to move through the ranks, the nursing ranks, which we are very excited about. Or really, uh, I have a sister, she's a retired ed uh, educational administrator who started uh, by taking care of my mom during the pandemic and is going to go off and get her RN at uh, 62 years old. Uh, we are reestablishing connections that were interrupted during the pandemic with our partners. 
um, in the community and in the greater healthcare community in Vermont. And uh, we think we're on the right path. As I said, we've developed a very responsible budget and we ask your support of that budget. Thank you. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. I um, also want to take a, uh, an opportunity to point out that Wayne Hobbs, our chief administrative officer, has also joined us today, um, though because of his newness, won't be answering any questions. And uh, a strategic partner, Chip Holmes, from Ovation Healthcare, in which Northwestern Medical Center has had a 40-year relationship with, um, has also joined us today uh, just to show his support. Um, as John said, it's been a year of transition. It's also been a year of challenge for us. Uh, we're currently at a negative 6.5 operating uh, margin. That is a result of um, uh, short shortcomings in gross revenue, uh, massive shifts in payer mix that have had uh, a significant impact on our net revenue. Um, we've made some strategic investments uh, in salaries and benefits. Um, to keep with the market, and that has actually helped drive down that traveler number. That has helped uh, recruit and retain, um, which, believe it or not, even though we're making the investment um, and in are over $2 million in, uh, over in salary, um, uh, is actually helping keep costs down, if that doesn't sound too uh, upside down. Uh, our benefits are off. You know, you can't really control when you're when your team members uh, uh, need to use their health care plan, but our benefits are a little bit over. Um, our supply costs are over, but that's strictly because of utilization. I want to point out that um, one of the things that we're the most proud of is we have about a 13.3% supply uh, cost when compared to um, uh, our revenue, uh, and that is one of the highest in our peer groups uh, in the Ovation and Premier Network. Uh, so we're, we're really, really proud of that. But the shift uh, in reimbursement continues to be a concern, particularly a, a, a pretty significant upward shift in Medicare Advantage and the, the kind of contract terms that we have with uh, the, the big Medicare Advantage provider, which um, if you want to talk about, we'd be happy to go into executive session later on. So that's just a, a quick outline of what this year has been like um, and, and what we're trying to do. As we try to climb out of that hole, we've done everything we can to be a good fiduciary uh, by trying to climb out of that hole and get to operational stability while doing our very best to follow the budget guidance that the, the board has put out. So um, there's no doubt about it. We didn't hit where your recommendations were, but I think we did a very good job at coming very, very close. Uh, and what we're asking for could certainly be more, um, but we wanted to be, again, um, responsible to your requests and responsible to the community at the, la at the same time. And I, I think when we look at community need, um, we've only put forward what we need, uh, and we've we've struck a, a fairly fair balance between the two requests. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of turn it over to Stephanie Bro, our chief financial officer, who's going to do a quick recap about where we stand today in terms of uh, you know Northwestern Medical Center being a low cost provider and and some of the good stats around that. Thanks, Peter, um, and thanks to everybody on the call today. You know, I think John and Peter have really already touched on some of the things that I wanted to touch on, right? John started by saying, you know, we never take a budget submission lightly. We never take a rate increase request lightly. Um, and so I really just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge the conversation that I heard at the beginning of these budget hearings, right? How do we look at affordability, but also hospital accountability, right? That's an issue that's very real and it's really complex. And so I don't pretend to have all of the answers. I don't think anybody does. Um, and so that's why I think we have to continue to talk about it as a group. Um, I do want to, I think what's something that struck me, right? The most about that conversation is how similar it really is to the conversations that we do have internally our leadership team and our board, you know, every time we prepare a budget, we kind of take a step back from that budget and we ask ourselves the same sort of questions that you ask of us, right? Um, did we hit the guidance? If we didn't, how come we didn't? And how close can we be to achieving that, the compliance with your guidance? Um, what is the rate increase request that we have asked for? And what does that do to pricing? What does it do to our community? Is it is it fair? Is it appropriate? Is it really a price increase to help us cover some 
uh, expenses that we truly can't control, you know, or are, is it a price increase for things where maybe we should be taking more risk and, and be on the hook? And so I really think this budget does um, put a significant amount of accountability and risk on NMC, but does help us cover some things that we truly can't control. We ask ourselves how much of an operating margin, right? What is that reinvestment margin that I like to call it? What is that? And is that enough? And is that sustainable? So really a lot of parallels. Um, you guys are wrestling with the same things that we're wrestling with. Uh, and I really think that we're taking a step in the right direction. Um, with Sarah's tool, I know the tool her and her team have developed. Uh, I really want to go ahead and echo uh, some of the compliments that I know my peers have already made um, around that tool. It's not perfect, but we can't let perfect be the enemy of good, and it's really a step in the right direction, so I really appreciate it. Um, I think the data will show, right, that NMC is a low-cost provider. It's something that we pay close attention to um, and want to continue to be. It's really important to us. NMC has worked really hard to control our expense growth, and uh, we think we have budgeted fairly and appropriately for inflation. Um, NMC has a long history of being below average or below the median for rate increase requests, so I think the data shows that too. Um, Peter already mentioned and John already mentioned, you know, some of the great progress we've made on reducing travelers and this budget holds us accountable to continue to do that. Um, this budget holds us accountable to continue to be a top performer around metrics like supply cost. Um, and I really just wanted to give, you know, really some credit to Sarah and her team for all of the analysis, all of the time, all of the work. If anyone can appreciate how much time it takes to put these budgets together, it's me um, and all the other hospital CFOs out there. So, so huge kudos and thank you uh, for everybody's time. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Peter just in the interest of time. He's going to speak a little bit more about kind of our future strategic direction and then I think we'll hand it over to Sarah. Thanks, Stephanie. So just kind of where are we going now that we've kind of the past is the past. We can't change. We only can control what we do today and where we go tomorrow. Um, we're in the process of launching a strategic refresh. Uh, come October 1 will be the beginning of the third year of a three year strategic plan. And we're going to be doing some planning over the next six months. So as we look to develop next year's budget, um, we have our strategic focus uh, in line. Um, our strategic plan is exceptionally strong. One of the things that I was really impressed about when I interviewed and, and a major decision uh, for me to come to this organization was an incredibly strong commitment from frontline staff all the way to the, the, the board to be a leapfrog grade A hospital and to be a five-star hospital. Those are above all else how we start every meeting um, with those two goals in mind um, and how we keep our razor sharp focus day in and day out. Um, the board is committed to being an independent hospital, but not a hospital on its own. We have incredibly strong partnerships with the University of Vermont. Um, we obviously, with them being 22 miles down the street, we share a lot of patients that go back and forth. Um, as, as my friend Jonathan Billings likes to say, we have the greatest NICU in the world. It's just 22 miles down the road. So as we deal with challenging babies, um, we work really hard to make those transitions in care uh, at all levels, whether uh, older adults or young babies, really, really smooth. And we're very proud um, of that UVM partnership. And I work very closely with my peer, Dr. Leffler, and with Dr. Epen to make sure that that partnership continues to strengthen. We also have an incredibly strong relationship with Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health and a telemedicine program. So we have a tele-ICU program. We're looking um, at ex expanding uh, that telemed program into other areas like psychiatric care um, and a variety of, of different places. But our friends at Dartmouth are very, very helpful day in and day out um, with patient care. And then uh, one of the partnerships that's just emerging uh, in the last uh, nine months is something I'm really excited about. Um, and it, we're calling it the Vermont Collaborative Hospital Network. And it is uh, a collaboration of independent hospitals in Vermont who uh, wanna do a variety of different things together. 
So an example of that is our great partnership with Copley Hospital, how we're sharing a cardiologist. Uh, another great example is a, a group of those six hospitals um, who want to lower their cost on fuel oil. Really exciting projects there. Things that we can't get through our premier GPO, um, like fuel oil. The cost of laundry is probably one of the single greatest cost increases that is driving our budget to be out of whack and something we literally have zero control over. So we're partnering with Ovation Healthcare, uh, a national organization that manages and works with hospitals across the country uh, to figure out how we can come up with our own solution to not have to rely on outs uh, outdoor uh, outside vendors. Uh, and that's really exciting. And the collaborative network, like I said, is just getting off the ground now, but all kinds of purchasing and collaborative efforts that, again, strong partnerships. We don't necessarily need to, to talk about ownership, to talk about being part of a system, um, but we're really, what we really want to talk about is who do we work with day in and day out to provide great patient care and keep it at a low cost. We're working diligently to improve um, our access to specialty care. We have long wait times in some of our subspecialty areas, and we're working hard to get those wait times down. Um, we're, we're working now, I think, Stephanie, I'm gonna look to Stephanie to check my numbers on this, but I think we are four days from referral to scheduling an appointment. Is that right? Yeah, so that, was, that number was way out of whack. It was several weeks. Um, and we work really hard to get that down, and that is, uh, you know, a continuous project. Um, we're very committed to becoming a, a high reliable, high reliable organization. Dr. Minadeo and some other folks lead our efforts to continue to provide education on what that means. So every week, um, we're providing education sessions. Um, we require new employees to go through our high reliable uh, education. Um, and it's it's really quite helpful in making changes every day uh, and improvements in safety and care. We're also very committed to lean daily management, um, doing Gemba rounds every day, uh, having KPI boards and all of our, uh, our key departments and driving change and improvement on a day in and day out basis. But again, we still face um, all the budget risks um, that we've already discussed. Subacute days is something that um, the, that we've gotten questioned about, and you know that's one of the risks that Stephanie is talking about. We're budgeting for a, a thousand uh, day reduction in subacute days. That's a big risk that relies on our ability um, to get patients out of the hospital and into a more uh, appropriate level of care. Our payer mix and net reimbursement also continues to be a risk that we're willing to take. The increase in Medicare Advantage, um, just one of the uh, one of the items under that, and uncontrollable cost increases, like I just talked about laundry, that uh, you know we're all struggling with. So um, we we have a, a razor sharp focus for the future, and um, and a good plan to attack it, and we're looking at all the partnerships to uh, to help make that come to fruition. So I'll stop there, and we look forward to answering your questions but thank you for the time. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just uh, give a quick overview of the things we're hoping to hit uh, in your hearing today. Uh, so you've already addressed some of these in your opening statements, but um, just trying to understand some of these investments in some more detail, maybe get some pro tips for how you were able to reduce some of these administrative uh, overhead costs, um, what you're finding to be successful in your traveler reduction efforts. I know that um, it certainly makes sense to me that you would need to invest to realize some of those uh, payoffs. Um, the increases for your non-physician uh, salaries, uh, already touched on some of the um, strategies you're using to increase your efficiency and uh, you know your all your continued focus on quality. Um, just a little bit more detail about some of that variation in the cost inflation, which you talked about already, some strategies that you're using to try to manage that. Um, and then just trying to understand a little bit more about pricing and um, specifically um, the gross versus the realized net among the commercial population and how you're kind of grappling with some of these utiliz utilization changes. Uh, all our PPS hospitals, we just want to double check if that um, little bit of bump in the final rate is going to be material to your budget. Um, talk about how you're thinking through the unwinding. Um, also, you address some of your wait time and visit lag uh, uh, issues that you're addressing, um, and you just hit the <laughs> amount of time it took to get between a call and a referral. 
Um, and just uh, understanding some of your strategic decisions around uh, infrastructure um, at your facility. So those are the ones that we um, hope to cover today. And I will move over to the tool and have Matt take it from here. Great, and can you all hear me? We can. Excellent. Um, so if we filter on TPS hospitals, which Sarah just did, um, we can see Northwestern came in just above the 8.6 benchmark at 10.3%, um, and below that for change in operating expense at 3.5. Um, just wanted to note that among the PPS hospitals, this was the smallest increase in OPEX we've received, excluding, of course, um, Rotland, who budgeted a decrease. Uh, you'll also see a 6% increase to the charge master and a 4.5% increase to commercial. This chart. Um, as noted, the NPR and operating expense this is on the previous slide. Um, NPR came in, came in above benchmark and operating expenses didn't have an official benchmark, but below that 8.6%. Um, moving to labor, you can see that there, there was a provider transfers we had to account for with Northwestern that kind of um, distorted the, these high level indicators. But if we, yeah, if we move to the labor tab, you can see the ECI benchmark, um, they're below that, and you can see a reduction in FTEs over time. Um, a question on labor, um, which you kind of touched on in the opening remarks and in your narrative, but you mentioned several items related to labor, like investment and in position to improve patient care and outcomes, um, reducing reliance on travelers, reduction in some executive level positions. I'm, and you also mentioned you're launching a strategic refresh, so I'm hoping not getting the cart ahead of the horse, but um, just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about your kind of how you're viewing the workforce um, issues like holistically. Sure. Do you want us to talk about that now? Yeah, that'd be great. Absolutely. Um, you, you know, a reduction in labor costs and reduction in travelers and retention, and we've had a drop. Um, a significant drop in open positions uh, to the point where we're pretty close to pre-pandemic levels when it looks at open positions. Um, I can sum it up in, in three words, culture, culture, and culture. Um, this is something that certainly predated my arrival uh, in January, um, but uh, you know, the folks around here will tell you uh, my mantra is us, them, money. So uh, what that means is you take really good care of your people. You make sure that they feel safe. You make sure that they feel heard. You make sure that they feel like they have a voice um, and, and how we're providing care. Um, and, uh, you know, our leadership team, their job is to take care of the staff at the front line because they take care of patients. You know, I don't take care of a single patient. Nobody comes to Northwestern Medical Center because Peter Wright is the CEO. They come because of um, Ms. Mr. Casavant's sister is working on the front lines and, and they know them and they listen and they take the time to walk someone down the hallway to a place they're going instead of pointing. So it's all about culture. And that is since since the organization has started to focus, we've seen those open positions start to melt away. We've seen those labor costs start to come down. Um, and you know we have quickly earned a reputation of a place that people want to come to work because they feel valued and they feel heard. Great, thank you. Can I just um, add to a couple of things Peter said? You know, I think when you look at this graph in front of us and you look at our most recent data point, you know, we're creeping our way up. But if we, you know, look at maybe PPS hospitals or just all the hospitals in general, it's it's just an area that I continue to worry about, right? Yeah, there we go. We switched to all and, and Northwestern's um, kind of down towards the bottom, I believe. Um, yeah, in that lower chunk. Um, and so I think one of the things that Peter and I talk about that we talk about with the board that sort of keeps us up at night is, you know, how do we keep pace um, is if we're still not 
um, at the top, not saying we need to be at the top, but, you know, depending on budgets that get approved and decisions that get made, you know, will we be able to, is our budget going to allow us to keep pace? And so it's something that we just have to continually monitor and keep an eye on. But in the current year, we absolutely, you know, made investments in base wages and in base salaries that were above and beyond what we budgeted for. And we knew it, right? We took that on as, hey, we're going to make a strategic investment and a strategic decision um, outside of what our approved budget was. And we're going to invest and, and we are starting to see a return on that investment, um, which is very, very nice. That's what you hope to see when you make those decisions. Yeah, I think on that labor tab, our average cost is 116,000. Um, and again, as Stephanie said, it, it took a tremendous uh, amount of work to get there. Uh, and again, we're worried about what will happen if the market shifts again and and labor goes up. Obviously, 65% of everything we spend money on is salary and benefits as being an organization of people taking care of people. So it's something that we, we watch very closely. And um, as Stephanie said, we we very much keeps us awake at night and particularly through this process. And were there any board questions about labor? Seeing none, were there think, any healthcare? Well, oh, Matt, I'm sorry. sorry. I was just yeah. slow. Um, I think in uh, the areas in this area slide that Sarah had pulled up earlier, I think one of the areas was related to the care management. I wonder if we could just get a little more color commentary on what's going on there. Sure, we added FTEs in care management, um, and that's absolutely about managing um, average length of stay and avoidable days. Um, I'll ask Stephanie to fill in with a little more detail. No, you're right. It was, you know, just like we decided to make investments in wages above and beyond what we budgeted, we did decide to make an investment in care management. It's one FTE. Um, so for our organization, that's what we added above and beyond what we had budgeted. And we did that intentionally. Um, I think you've heard it's been a pretty common theme for most hospitals, right, that it's been more challenging to place patients and get them into that right care setting at the right time. Um, and so we really found that if we could add an FTE to that care management team, um, that, you know, it could quickly be a return on investment if we are able to, you know, move some move some patients to the appropriate care setting in a in a quicker way. And so we're just starting to see a little bit of a a decrease in our average length of stay. And you know it's early, so I don't want to make any promises, but um, at least it's moving in the right direction. And so it's going to be key to our strategy next year of you know really reducing subacute days and avoidable days. Yeah, we've had uh, we've had subacute patients that were here over 200 days. Uh, actually, when you put two stays together, one patient was here over a year um, and just, you know, incredibly complicated working with a state, working with uh, every day that requires effort. Every one of those over 400 days that that patient was here. When you uh, factor out the outliers, um, we're doing a very good job when we benchmark against the geometric length of stay. Um, so Dr. Minadeo and I uh, look at that information and um, we're making great progress uh, and, and feel that that investment is certainly paying off. Thank you, that was helpful. Um, I'm wondering if this is related to an, on your submission and I'm sorry, I'm not seeing page numbers, um, hold on. I think it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and page 11, um, which has an operating expense chart on the bottom. That might be the easiest way to find it and across from the bond covenants ovation healthcare chart. Um, in your narrative, you indicate um, that you, using the benchmarking through Ovation, you know there are opportunities for continued efficiency and that you've made the choice to invest in positions that place you outside of the benchmark to improve care and experience and outcomes for patients. Is that sort of alluding to um, some of your care management staff or I just wanted to understand that a little bit better? Yeah, that's a couple of different areas. It's, Kathy, I believe that care management is part of it. 
but it's also um, th things like environmental services. So, you know, if we were to fall, we first of all, I think it's important to point out we don't go for the 50th percentile like you might expect. Um, all of our departments are benchmarked at the 75th percentile. So that's their target. Um, and we are at 96%. Um, of that target. So I think that's really important to point out. But in areas like environmental services, um, we have to and actually intentionally make investments with added FTEs to make sure that we have a clean and a safe facility. We need to keep that infection rate down. Um, so, uh, you know, those are areas where we're a little bit, we're a lot closer to the 50th percentile in terms of the benchmark. But I think it's really important to point out that we're already holding ourselves to a, a much higher standard. I'm gonna turn to Stephanie and have her uh, fill in with some more info. Yeah, so care management, uh, definitely one of them, That the one FTE we talked about, um, environmental services, one of them. And then for us, it's it's some of those, you know, you want to disproportionately invest in those areas where you're really trying to make gains. And so human resources and organizational development, right, building that culture that we talked about earlier on, that's an area having to recruit and retain um, so many employees over this past year and, and going forward. So there's uh, 1.5 FTEs there where we know we're not hitting the 75th, but we feel like we're doing what's right and what's appropriate. Um, information technology, that's an area we want to lean on our electronic record. We want to lean on information technology as much as possible when it comes to high reliability and our processes and processes and making things more efficient. Um, and so that's an area where we know we're outside of that 75th percentile by again, about 1.5 FTEs. And then quality and process improvement. Um, so much of high reliability, um, lean daily management, KPI boards tracking, um, you know, our goal against being five star and leapfrog grade A, we're really investing in that quality team to help us use that evidence-based um, information and, and be out on the floors working with those clinical teams and getting our, our workflows where they need to be. So those are just some examples. Those are most of the examples really of the areas that are not achieving that 75th percentile um, benchmark information that we have from Ovation. Thanks very much. May I just do a quick follow up on that? Because I think it's really fascinating and I, I really appreciate all the efforts. It sounds like multi pronged efforts to improve efficiencies and uh, ensure that you are delivering high quality care with the goals of the five star rating and leapfrog A. So I'm, I'm really um, intrigued by all of this. And I'm just wondering with respect to some of that ovation health care um, benchmarking, do you do benchmarking? Um, within each department in terms of something more like visits per day per clinical FTE in terms of throughput of patients. I know access is an important issue. It came out um, in the uh, community needs health assessment as a critical area. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to what you're seeing in terms of the benchmarking there in terms of throughput of patients. And yeah, what, there's so, what metrics you look at. I'm just guessing something like visits per day per clinical FTE, but I, I, I don't know what you're using or how you benchmark. So I'd love to hear more about that. Go ahead, Stephanie. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. So for the outpatient practices, that is what their benchmark would be, right? It's office visits um, per clinical FTE. For an area like our inpatient unit, it's going to be patient days, right? For an area like our laboratory, it's going to be, you know, number of billable lab tests. And so I think one of the great things about um, the premier benchmarking information that we have through Ovation um, is that it really is tailored and it's department specific. So if we have, you know, 45 different departments, we have 45 different benchmarks and we get them updated annually and they're broken down into similar sized hospitals to us. Um, and so you don't feel like you're working with, you know, really old stagnant information that kind of doesn't even apply to you. But um, but the short answer to your question is it depends what you are for a department because they're all a little bit different. And in terms of those kinds of outcomes, you're still uh, targeting the 75th percentile. 
That's yeah, fair. we are targeting, yep, 75th for everyone. We're asking them to get 100% of the 75th percentile, and some are over and some are under, and we just talked about some of the areas that are under, but um, it's a pretty aggressive benchmark, but we believe that, you know, that that should be the right target, and then when they're not meeting it, we have conversations. It's a tool. It's just, it's part of the bigger picture of, well, is this an area where we know we're trying to focus and we're trying to invest, or is this an area that's kind of business as usual and really should be able to achieve that benchmark. We look at every FTE that's that's trying to be filled and we bring in that benchmark as a tool and we have a conversation before any position is posted um, just to make sure that each and every FTE that we put out there is reviewed carefully. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I hope you don't mind me jumping in here, Matt, but um, this might be an interesting time to just talk about what I think a lot of hospitals are grappling with in terms of figuring out right sizing the hospital versus what might make sense as a community practice. And I was just wondering if you could talk us through how you approach those strategic decisions and uh, what sort of input goes into it for you. Sure. Any services that we provide and whether they grow or whether they shrink um, is a strategic conversation. It ties directly to the community health needs assessment. Um, it ties directly to what we see um, are the needs of the community, what we're hearing from. We do not own primary care as you kind of inferred and could see from the physician transfers. So we work very closely with our strategic partners. We have um, we have primary care folks in an FQHC that sprawled throughout uh, the region, as well as a private practice that not only has um, several clinics in Franklin County, but has clinics uh, across the state. So we're not dealing with small operations. We're dealing with larger, sophisticated operations who really have an understanding of the market from a primary care perspective. Um, and we, we put a lot of weight and emphasis on, on their input. Um, we also look at if we don't do it, who else will? And what will that cost? You saw a lot of information and, you know, we're not much for bragging, but I think on this one area, we're going to take a moment to brag. We are a very low cost provider. We're one of, um, and in some areas, the lowest cost provider uh, in the state, depending upon the metric that you want to look at. And so it's very real to us that as we balance our fiduciary responsibility with keeping the organization afloat and making sure that we're here for the next hundred years. We also do that with, but if we don't do it, who will and how much will that cost the community? So I, I think, you know, it's a complex process. It's a delicate balance. The conversations are, are always rich and robust, but also very hard um, because it's just, it's just not easy anymore. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, Sarah, may I just jump in here for a quick second? Because I one of my questions was about this point exactly. Is that all right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, we are trying to figure out, it is interesting, we hear um, about as hospitals employ, you know, independent practices, the costs actually for to the patient tend to increase because of higher reimbursement rates um, and facility fees and all of that. And yet, you know, it's interesting Northwestern has chosen strategically um, to transition the pediatric practice and the primary care practice and addiction medicine and dermatology out. And, and, I'm, and it's listed in your narrative as a cost savings. And so I'm intrigued by um, the strategic decision and how also the practices are able to be sustainable outside the umbrella of Northwestern. Um, and yet they were not sustainable with umbrella of Northwestern is we're sort of watching, you know, nationally these consolidation of, you know, vertical consolidation, just trying to understand the strategic decision you faced and why it's a cost savings to you not to um, keep these practices under the umbrella and how they're sustaining themselves outside. You could sure, I'll a take a first stab yeah. of that and then I'll have Stephanie fill in where, where I fall short. Um, let me just point out that um, the dermatology transfer, that was a desire from the provider to go into private practice. That wasn't a strategic decision on our part to, to move that. That was the provider saying, hey, I'd love to be private practice. Okay, no problem. Um, I will tell you, as long as I've been doing this, there is, there is nothing um, that will turn a clinic less productive. <laughs> and, um, 
and frustrate the staff more than having them become part of a hospital network. We're good at running hospitals. And when we bring on clinics, we treat them not like clinics. Um, and this is the field. This is across the United States. We treat them like small hospital departments and we burden them with hospital policy and hospital bureaucracy, which we have to do by regulation and that just add cost to it. So I would tell you that while it's it's easier when you own a practice to drive a strategic initiative, um, it is certainly, uh, in my opinion, in my experience, more cost effective um, when they're managed outside of the hospital system. Um, it also drives uh, better collaborative discussion um, and a more robust, um, broad look at, at, at the way the system works. You, in our organization, in our community, we have a, a federally qualified health center. By definition, that's like critical access hospital status for primary care. They get cost-based reimbursement for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and so literally what would be our worst payers in a clinic become their best payers in a clinic. There's also uh, RHC status, rural health clinic status, um, that provides enhanced reimbursement uh, in those areas. And quite frankly, um, it's about focus. So, you know, the notch, who's our um, FQHC, they do one thing. They just do primary care. They don't do anything else. They have an electronic medical record that supports primary care. They have an administrative staff and infrastructure that supports primary care. And so when you do one thing and you become razor focused, I believe you have the opportunity to do it better. You don't always do it better, but you have the opportunity to do it better. And that's what we've found. And certainly I believe that's the case here in Franklin County. Our private practice, as we said, um, you know, they don't just have clinics uh, across Franklin County, but they have clinics across the state. And again, they're focused on one thing, primary care, their electronic medical record, their sharing of best practices uh, and keeping up on what's best for the community. They become razor focused. And so instead of everything coming under one system, you've got a lot of individual experts. Um, and what we've seen and what I've seen in my time, you know, a little over 22 years is that particularly when it comes to primary care, um, this uh, proves to be really, really beneficial for the patient, um, for the community and, and for cost. So we made those strategic decisions to make that transfer. It did save us money because we were investing, right? The profitability or the, the P&L on those individual departments, we were subsidizing them when they were part of the system. Now we don't have to subsidize. So that's where the savings comes from. But now they're moving into an area where they don't not only not have to be subsidized, but because of the certain designations and the experience, they're actually getting uh, better reimbursement and, and more operational efficiency. Stephanie, did I leave anything out? Um, I think I would just say like, you know, a these decisions are always really individual. And so again, with primary care, adult primary care, you know, we had the FQHC and so why compete, you know, let's get together with them and have this conversation. That one can be a little bit of an easier thing. Um, again, you already, you know, Peter already explained dermatology was really um, just something that was approached uh, we were approached about. I think pediatrics was really tough, right? I'm not going to lie. Like if if there had not been a workable solution somewhere else for pediatrics, Northwestern would still have pediatrics because we can't just abandon the community in that way, right? So I think some of these services, you look at them and you have to ask yourself if there might be another solution and then you go have those conversations. And if you find out there is, then that's the best news possible. If you find out that there isn't, um, then there isn't and you ask yourself what your responsibility is as a as a community hospital and then i think in terms of you know the budget narrative and talking about our changes in expenses over the years part of this truly is a, a math reconciliation as to what has happened with our total expenses well these expenses went away these ones went away these ones went away and these expenses came on board it that's a little bit different than trying to say this is the amount of operating loss that went away so I don't know if that helps, Jessica. Some of our, our numbers are really just trying to help reconcile um, the change in expenses versus you know, what we gained from profitability or losses as a result of those decisions. And if no, I that's could, really helpful. The whole conversation it, has been helpful. So I if appreciate I could it. Just, if I could just add to that, Jessica, 
some historical context. We we got into the pediatric business because uh, the 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 large group in our community had fallen apart, and we we got into that business to stabilize pediatrics and access to pediatricians in our community. And in the same way, we got into the primary adult primary care medicine business because there was an access issue in Franklin County. Um, and so th those things were both seen, I think, by the board as temporary. And temporary was a few years longer, maybe than we anticipated, but it was about creating and maintaining capacity for, for our service area. Super helpful. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Chair, Chair Foster, this is um, Tom and Director Lindbergh, if I could just take a second. Um, no real questions, but I just wanted to compliment um, Peter and Stephanie and team. Um, Peter, your description of uh, the benefits of separation um, following a long period in our country of consolidation was one of the best I've heard. Um, I hope, I'm sure we have it recorded. I wanna listen to it again, um, but it was really excellent. And your commitment to community needs assessment that you started off with and the alignment of your practices based on that was outstanding. And your commitment to um, a focus on safe and reliable health care and your HRO journey being as important as your budget. You've talked more about your HRO journey in the beginning than you did your budget. Those um, were all outstanding. And um, I'm, I'm just <laughs> really pleased to be hearing all of it. So um, I think you're on a great path um, for what it's worth coming from one board member um, who's spent a lot of time thinking about high reliability um, and separation versus integration. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. I appreciate your compliments. I don't have any questions. Um, this is a very strong submission and a strong presentation. So thanks for putting in the work. I, this was impressive. So thank you. You're welcome, sir. Yeah. Were there any additional board questions on this topic? I'm not if not, sure which yeah. specific topic we are. We are. Uh, on. Sorry, yeah, we, we, we merged a lot together, but I, I guess I have one <laughs> question that's related to utilization that I just wanted to ask. Which you know, you talked a lot about um, the increased length of stay of patients you're trying to get to skilled nursing facilities, and had a nice analysis of that in the submission. I I was just wondering if you could comment on other drivers of length of stay, other that that you that you've identified, other than trying to get patients to skilled nursing facilities. Or, it's all over or, the place. Long-term care, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's all over the place. Um, even if it's not long-term care, sometimes it's just to home. Um, we've had scenarios where we've, uh, you know, pay, we pay for hotel rooms because somebody lives on a second floor and they're not quite ready. They don't meet um, acute status and so they're no longer appropriate to be in the hospital, but they, they can't get, uh, you know, into their apartment, which is on the second floor. Um, in all honesty, there are less um, and more heartbreaking scenarios. This is an actual, um, you know, we're at the mountain and we're not able to pick up mom, uh, you know, until Sunday or the weekend. There's crazy stuff like that as well. So it, it really does go all over. Um, the majority is certainly access to long-term care. Some of it is, um, uh, patients with Alzheimer's, we're, we're seeing a, a dramatic increase in, um, you know, patients who suffer from these type of memory diseases um, and, and become quasi-violent. Uh, you know, certainly mental health, as you've heard from other hospitals, you know, access to appropriate beds, particularly if it's a, a pediatric patient or an adult where you have mental health on top of memory issues and, and complex um, medical issues that again, don't meet hospital level care, but but need a lot of care coordination and follow up. Um, so there's a, a variety of different reasons. Our care manager would love to spend hours with you and and lay that all out because I know she keeps track of them very carefully. Um, but those are the, the major issues. Sometimes it has to do with just a simple ride. How do we get somebody home because they don't meet the criteria for an ambulance ride home yet 
you know, we are not comfortable putting them in a taxi and just saying, go home. And we, we do to the safety and quality aspect that Mr. Walsh was talking about. Um, it, it can be frustrating when someone's ready for discharge, but we're just not comfortable putting them in, in a taxi or or some other mode of transportation um, if we don't feel that they're going to be safe, if we don't feel that they can get in their home or anything that we feel would cause them to be readmitted. As much as we work on length of stay, we're even more focused on readmissions and keeping that number down and making sure that the patient truly is ready to go home. Thanks. Stephanie, do you want to add anything? Oh. I think I think I would just say our our partnership with Dartmouth around tele ICU and telestroke um, is also something that's helping us keep more patients here. And so those patients tend to be more complex. And so there's the kind of acuity piece that goes along with it. But I think, you know, the I think that our clinical teams would tell you that we keep sicker patients here now than we used to. Thank you for that. I it's how many the, one of the other questions I had along the way was how many tele ICU beds are you staffing at this point or beds that you use the tele ICU services for? We have 10. We have a, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, Stephanie, please. <laughs> we have 10 beds that are um, wired for that tele ICU service, and I believe we're bringing two more online. Um, so it's a combination of ICU patients and step down patients who use those beds. And, and we do have Don and Dr. Menadeo here as well, if you had uh, more questions about that. But 10 is the fine. answer. <laughs> and the other, the other question I had for you on, on labor related expenses was uh, you discussed your plans to reduce traveler expenses. And I just wanted to know whether or not you were having any concerns that that would decrease access to care, staff beds available, ED space available. Yeah, uh, I, and I think, go ahead, Peter. I think we're committed to keeping those um, beds open as long as we can afford to do so. You know, if, you know, again, we're, we're in a scenario now where a negative six and a half percent operating margin, it's really tough to continue to invest in those travelers, but we need to do it in order to keep the beds open. Our census remains high. Today we have 34 patients uh, on our inpatient unit and 10 more in our family birthing center. So um, a, a lot of those are in the emergency department as well. And so making sure that we are able to handle that load is, is critically important. So uh, it's one of those things where it's painful um, and it's the one thing we'd love to be able to change but you know, as long as we're committed to serving the community with the uh, the the number of services that we do today, we have to keep them on board. Um, but we also have a plan, and so there's several uh, permanent staff members in training and orientation. So we also know 60, 90, 120 days out how that's going to chip down. Thank you. You're welcome. Board member Walsh, did I see your hand up or was I oh, I'm mistaken? Okay, thank you. Also, um, thank you. Um, on utilization in your exhibit 10, you also you note almost a $2 million reduction in overall um, commercial NPR just due to utilization. And this seemed uh, looked almost entirely attributable to professional fees. I was just curious if you could describe um, what's occurring there, what's driving that. Yeah, so some of that data is being skewed by the transfers, right? The, the movement out of pediatrics and adult primary care. So that's a, a big part of it. Um, and then the other part of it is, you know, we, we mentioned in our introduction, and again, if we need to go into more detail with this with you guys, we're happy to, um, but really seeing that big shift in the Me Medicare Advantage, and we bucket those under the commercial bucket. Um, so all of those Medicare Advantage plans are in that commercial bucket for our budget submission for our numbers. Um, and, and reimbursement's challenging in that space. And so that's really starting to have um, a significant impact. So those are the two things that are kind of driving that number. Maybe. I didn't have any more questions about utilization, if there are other staff or board questions. 
Mine's just a, a request for a quick follow up on um, with regard to the wait times, which I'm not sure falls under utilization, but I'm going to put it into utilization um, in terms of access. Um, and I appreciated the information about the referral lag being four days um, in the in the narrative. It mentioned that you don't document um, referral times. And so it sounds like now you've updated your EMR to be able to, to do that, to be able to calculate those referral lags. So on the one, one thing, so appreciated. Secondly, I'm just wondering if you might be able to submit that along with the visit lags by specialty so that we can get a sense of where the bottlenecks are. And we're trying to get that from all hospitals so we can really understand where are the access pain points across the state by specialty area. So just a quick request for a follow up on referral and visit lags by specialty area. Yeah, yeah, we definitely have to collect it somewhat manually. So we created different categories um for ourselves to to track the referral lag and our goal is is three days we're averaging four days um and so some of them are at one and i think the highest one is around 10. um and so we're happy to provide um the work we have done to capture that data and provide it to you i just i want to say i really appreciate that because i think a referral lags is, is under counted and i'm sitting on several myself personally that are in in the weeks so not to NMC, I will say, but uh, I think if we don't <laughs> capture that information on uh, referral lag, we don't really truly know or understand how long people are waiting to be seen. So I appreciate the efforts manually, if it may be. Um, hopefully you can get it into you know a better way through the EMR system in the future, but really, really important. I know many people who are waiting weeks to have appointments just even scheduled. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other board questions on utilization? And I'll pause and ask, I apologize again, if the healthcare advocate has any questions on um, topics covered. Thanks, Matt, not so far. Um, our questions are more, more in the cost coverage category. Great, thank you. Um, so jumping to pharmaceutical expenses and cost inflation, I was wondering if you could speak more to your experiences um, with pharmaceutical expense growth and um, general cost inflation. I know during the narrative you mentioned uh, laundry being a major kind of uncontrollable driver. And um, other than pharmaceuticals, I was wondering if there's other kind of categories like that that, you know, maybe are significant to the hospital, but, you know, like laundry, we don't immediately, or at least I don't immediately think of. Yeah, we um, another benefit of our partnership with Ovation Healthcare is um, through our group purchasing organization. Uh, it's all tied together, and so they provide us with these really wonderful reports right around budget time every year that says, "Hey, here's what you can expect for inflation," and it's broken into really detailed categories, um, and it's even more detailed than what we can honestly fit into the budget system. But we try to not just do a blanket or just do an across the board, so we're able to see, oh. We should expect, you know, this type of orthopedic implant to go up by 15% and these other ones are only going to go up by 2% or by nothing. Um, and so we do try to, you know, get as specific as what's reasonable. All of that really both on the pharmaceutical side and on just the other supplies and other inflation side for NMC ended up averaging 5%. Um, and so that's that's our approach every year is to take that really detailed information, um, put it into our budget system as detailed as we can, but then calculate the overall um, and speak to that overall in our budget narrative. I think linen is one of those things where um, we're our inpatient census has been higher than what it had been historically. And so part of it is just a, a usage, like a poundage issue, right? You actually pay for linen by the pound. Um, and then some of it is being driven by a cost issue. Um, the lack of uh, choice and providers available to have that linen service. Um, and so to some extent, you kind of feel like you're, you're out there at the at the mercy of the market because there's not a lot of choice. And I'll turn it over to Peter for any other comments on that. Yeah, recently coming from Maine, I can tell you that uh, the major systems in Maine, as well as New Hampshire, uh, you know, linen cost per pound um, is driving them to 
uh, think about creating their own facilities, their own networks, becoming their own vendor, similar to what we're exploring in the Vermont Collaborative Hospital Network with Ovation. So um, it's just one of those odd things. It generally doesn't fall within the reach of a GPO. Uh, and so the price volatility uh, is far more sensitive. Thank you. Any uh, board questions along the inflation or, or pharmaceutical expense line? I wouldn't mind, it might not be, you just mentioned it, Mr. Wright, but the Vermont Collaborative Network, I hadn't heard of that myself and maybe I'd missed it, but when did that launch and who's participating in it? So right now it's just uh, formal conversations, although we did efficiently develop a, a logo for it. Um, I can tell you that Northwestern Medical Center, Copley and Springfield are firm participants. Um, we're also having conversations um, with some other hospitals and I, I hesitate to mention their name because it's not my place. Um, but you know, three other independent hospitals uh, in, in the state of Vermont uh, so you can do the math on your own, um, it, you know, and it's just about saying, hey, we're an independent hospital. Hey, we want to participate in things like maybe I need half of this subspecialty of a physician and you need half. Can we recruit uh, and share that member of the medical staff? It could be a physician, could be an advanced practice. Um, you know, I could certainly use to save uh, you know, 10 cents per gallon on my fuel oil. Laundry's killing me too. Um, you know, uh, uh, IT, how do we, you know, how do we continue to make investments in IT, keep our systems safe and modern, um, but also find ways to, uh, you know, share cost, whether uh, uh, through a, a collective data center or things like that. We're just getting the conversations off the ground. So the, the network hasn't, formally legally come together, um, but it is uh, a, a group that is actively talking and actually now we're uh, working with Ovation um, to hire, to jointly hire a position um, that would staff and drive these initiatives forward, hopefully by the fall. But we're doing things like, you know, for example, Copley Hospital is also doing their strategic planning um, you know, kind of reorg their, their new strategic plan in the fall. We're going to participate in uh, half a day of their strategic plan to figure out what we can do together. They're going to come over to our strategic planning process and spend a half a day with us and with our board. Our board chairs are talking about how we can collaborate more. Um, you know, Mr. Wooden and I spend lots of time on the phone and you know i'm i'm looking at a chemical that he discovered that helps clean surfaces uh a lot better than what we're using today uh and is a bit of a revolutionary product so we're we're sharing those ideas and and collectively doing purchases together where it makes sense so it's it's very early in the stages i'd say it started maybe just shy of a year ago in terms of its development and people meeting and getting together and agreeing to work together. And so it's in those early kind of forming stages. Well, thanks. It's interesting to hear about. Um, I might try and reach out and learn more about it at some point that's appropriate, but but thanks for the overview on that. You're welcome. We'd, we'd welcome the opportunity to talk to you about it more. Great. Cool. Thank you. You ready for me to walk through my esoteric stuff, Matt? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, sure. Okay, so uh, again, in our learning phase about the cost report and what we can learn from it. So here, mostly just to, to hear your response to some of these measures, but uh, for a small rural hospital, we see Northwest right at the median. So again, 50% uh, of the hospitals with comparator group were smaller and 50% were, or half were larger. Um, and for your case mix index, we see a relatively lower acuity, very similar um, to your peer in Southwestern at 1.39. Um, I was just curious if um, I've heard other hospitals say that, you know, really, um, Getting full credit for your CMI usually depends on some expensive software and other tools. So I was just wondering if you feel like um, there's any distortions in that CMI compared to your peers, and if, if you had to guess. Uh, 
I think that number might be a little bit soft. What Stephanie said earlier, with our new partnership with Dartmouth and uh, Tele ICU, so we're keeping higher acuity patients. So some of that may be just the timing of that data. Um, Stephanie, I don't know if you want to chime in on that. Yeah, I mean, it's every, you know, CFOs love this stuff, right? Like, how do we make sure we get paid for everything that we do do, right? And get credit for everything that we do do. And so, you know, we've really looked at something called CDI, Clinical Documentation Integrity, and um, have one of our staff members actually going through a CDI um, certificate program and education so that she will be reviewing in real time, you know, the inpatients on the floor, looking for anything that might be missing around coding or documentation, um, just to try to make sure that we get this right. Because I, I completely agree with Southwestern, it's a tricky thing. Um, and you miss stuff and sometimes you don't know what you don't know, right? You, I, you don't know what was missed. Um, and so that that's, I would just say ditto <laughs> to Southwestern. Okay. <laughs> okay, fair, fair. Um, and then when it comes, I think this is the indicator we're struggling the most with and maybe it's going to be one of them that we need the most work to make sure we're measuring what we intend to. But uh, we do see your, uh, so again, this is the ratio of what's classified as true admin in general on line five compared to the salaries listed through lines 30 to 100. So it'd only be the labor that actually shows up on your cost report, which I know um, often doesn't represent everything. So I'm just wondering from where you sit, like uh, what might we might be missing from looking at it this way? Yeah, this was one where I, you know, I really thought about it over the weekend and thought, man, I don't, I don't have a great answer to it, knowing that we're a bit showing a bit on the high side. But, you know, I will say I'm really curious. It's one of the things I'm going to dig into right after this budget process and try to understand if I'm doing something differently on the cost report than my peers are. Um, so no specific comments at the moment. I won't call it wrong. I won't call it any of those things, um, but it's just something that we're really going to dig into. I appreciate that. And, you know, we are uh, toying with kind of more representative ways to get at like a apples to apples admin ratio. Um, so appreciate your uh, wisdom on that. Um, from what I understand, that line five doesn't have a whole lot of guidance. And so all sorts of things may or may not end up there. <laughs> um, okay. uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so this would be uh, the cash available for operations at the end of fiscal year 22. Um, given your submission, I think your cash position probably looks a bit different today. And I also know that um, this would not account for any donor restricted funds. So I just want to give you an opportunity to comment on anything you think might be non-representative about that particular measure compared to your peers. Yeah, I mean, we're, we've always been fortunate, I won't say always, but in the recent history have been fortunate to maintain our strong days cash on hand. It's just, it's really helped yeah. us get through the last five years, right? Um, and we absolutely were using that money um, right now to fund, you know, an ED renovation project that's really needed and, and we're very excited about that you all approved a couple years ago. So, um, you know, we continue to look at that money as a way for us to to really move the organization forward in the future at a lower cost to the system, if not having to borrow. Yeah, I think right. that's important yeah. that we we fully fund depreciation. And so our capital costs each year are cash um, and we're not taking on debt. And that allows us to maintain a, a really strong structure of, of low cost. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, like I said, the profitability measures, I don't think are where anyone would like to see them in fiscal year 22. Um, so obviously that came in negative, but uh, around the 25th percentile. So even kind of relatively uh, worse operating results than some of your um, companions here. So uh, seems like things are starting to turn around in fiscal year 23, but still a long way to go. Does that feel representative? <laughs> That is yeah, correct. Yeah, it's my least favorite statistic, Sarah. Um, and, <laughs> and the one that keeps me up at night is our current operational deficit. And, you know, we're going to have to make some some uh, very complicated uh, decisions to get to get back in a in a safe and responsible level. Yeah. Um, and so when we look at the average uh, uh, cost for a Medicare discharge, um, so from what I understand, this 13,000 if say your CMI was a little bit up, would probably drop down into this box is kind of what I'm picking up. Um, but I just thought 
if what what your reactions were to seeing that compared to some of these other hospitals. <laughs> Yeah, it's the first time I've seen it CMI adjusted. So if I do just the traditional, right, cost per adjusted Medicare discharge, I get like $9,500. Um, mm -hmm. So seeing this CMI adjusted number, it's kind of like, oh, is that is that correct? Is it that sensitive to the to the adjustment of the case mix index? And that's just something that I, it's also something I'm really gonna dig into after these budget hearings, because I think that's the only difference between the way I've always traditionally calculated it and the way it's being done here. So just something for us to dig into, but happy to dig into it. Sure. I've already been in it once because I didn't see teams meeting in Outlook. Mm -hmm. Let's see, somebody. Oh. <laughs> okay, I think we're good there. Uh, okay, um, and then so cost coverage, um, when I look at uh, Northwest, uh, for one, I see not having cost coverage covered on the inpatient side from commercial and um, that kind of stagnating. Looks like there was a little bit of a bump maybe. Um, again, this is sensitive to the data we have access to. Um, but kind of been stable through 21 and 22. Um, see kind of a general deterioration in the inpatient coverage for Medicare for you all um, and low, but uh, more consistent outpatient coverage. And uh, again, seeing a similar uh, downward slope for the Medicaid. Um, and when I look at you compared to your peers, um, you do show up as being one of the lower cost ones. Um, and it does look I just look at the um, outpatient, you are notably one of the lowest um, with uh, the coverage being about 261% of that Medicare allowable cost, but Sarah? on the inpatient side. Yeah. Sarah, I think that's North Country. I believe we were under the PPS oh, hospital NMC. Of course you would be. Thank you. I was wondering why this didn't make sense. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so there you are. Yeah, very uh, in line with your peers, but that cost coverage uh, quite low uh, for inpatient but for both governmental payers and also not keeping up with commercial as we saw. And thank you for that correction because that's a totally different story. And we see, yeah, you're at uh, just under 200% uh, um, of the Medicare allowable cost, but not meeting both costs for either governmental payers. So um just seeing that uh your your relative payment though uh is quite low uh you and cbmc being the lowest uh and that seems to tie to if i were to reverse engineer some of the things in your uh narrative uh you saying that your charges are among the lowest in the state and so my main question here just has to do with it's always a tough uh decision about um figuring out what you need to ask from the commercial payers and just curious how you approach that task and um how you're dealing with it in this recovery period yeah i think you know as you can see this kind of really highlights the cost shift uh effect um you know what we ask for commercial you know we always try to go in with as as low a rate uh, request as possible to try to be reasonable just to keep you know operations going um i think that you know we've we've got to have some very real conversations about the cost of inpatient care and um the shift back you know we saw a dramatic drop in utilization um during the pandemic and those patients are sicker uh and and they're coming um you know in in a in a regular stream, and that's not just Vermont. I saw it in Maine. I saw it in New Hampshire, um, and with the connections I have across the country, we're seeing the same thing. So we've got to think about uh, this. This goes back to rate reductions that from about eight years ago. Um, there was a pretty significant rate reduction, um, and uh, you know we've paid for that in the eight years since with operational losses. So we've we've got to find a way to get that back to at least, you know, that dotted line, um, but, you know, do so in a, in a reasonable way. I mean, you know, things are changing and, um, you know, and, and payment reform is real and something that we not only subscribe to, but we're an advocate for. So we're, we're trying to figure that out. And I, I wouldn't say that we actually have an answer for it today. <laughs> right, you'd be too busy collecting your Nobel Prize if you knew that. Um, right. And so as far as the RAND data goes, I think this is where I noticed it's most uh, materials, the lower than typical commercial reimbursement. So Northwest 
is below the 25th percentile on inpatient at that um, 14,000. Uh, so what we do is we figure out how much was paid for commercial and divide that by a standard unit of service. So um, compared to your peers, you're, you're quite low on both uh, inpatient and outpatient side. So below the 25th percentile and right at the 25th percentile. And I think, um, again, that jibes with what was in your um, submission. So those were the uh, things that to cover in this tool. I don't know if there are questions from the board or the healthcare advocate that would be helpful to have this up for, but I would welcome those now. Sarah, can I just ask a quick question on this, which is, um, can you or Stephanie or Peter understand how to reconcile that CMI adjusted cost per Medicare discharge, which is high, and the RAND cost per inpatient stay? It, it, they're at the, the opposite ends. Um, most of the trends and and what I'm seeing is that their reimbursements are low but I'm not quite understanding how the cost per discharge is high with the reimbursements being low in other places. That is definitely a Stephanie question. <laughs> and it's and it's definitely one I don't have the answer to today, but but yes, we can, you know, right after this really dig into that. And because that's just, when I go through all of our data on this tool, you know, that CMI adjusted cost per adjusted discharge number is just the one that I was like, oh, that just really doesn't look right. It doesn't make sense. So, so yes, we're just gonna have to figure that out. I will just point out that this uh, specifically is gonna be limited to the commercial side of it. So it's entirely possible to have a high cost per discharge, but not get reimbursed uh, well from a commercial payer. That is true. If that helps. Or, well, I mean, I don't mean to have a judgment there, uh, relatively uh, lower than uh, your peers. Dan, you came off camera, what do you got? Thanks, Sarah. Um, I don't know if this is the best place for it, but I think it makes sense. Um, Sam Peich, Healthcare Advocate, good to see uh, everyone. Um, just want to start off with a couple brief comments. I really want to commend Northwestern for the work that you've done coming in really close to the guidance. I think last year, if my memory serves, you were the only possible that came aligned with the guidance. Um, and also your strategic investments in labor and reducing operational expenses at the same time. I think sometimes we hear that those two things can't go together. Um, but I think it's a testament to the culture that you spoke about. Um, and I wanted to mention with the implementation of Act 119, the Patient Financial Assistance Bill, we hope that we can work together as we did years ago um, and a kind of interactive process to um, that we hope to do with all hospitals, but um, we have that existing relationship, so we hope to build on that. Um, so our question is, I mean, a no surprise related to free care and bad debt. Um, we noticed a trend towards more uncompensated care overall and also more bad debt in the last couple of years. I'm just wondering if you could speak to that and elaborate on why that's the case. Sure, I'll, I'll let Stephanie provide the detail, but I think we're, you know, we're pretty consistent with what we heard other hospitals testify. Um, you know, we'd love to see that shift. We'd love it if patients would fill out that paperwork um, in our current, our, our, our encouragement. Um, you'll notice in our budget submission that we provide access to financial counselors and have a very robust um, charity care program, upwards of 400% of the federal poverty level. So there's a lot of opportunity. We would certainly love to see that shift. Um, it's really about patient engagement and patient participation um, that we're just not seeing uh, a response um, and, and patients taking that seriously, which um, is painful for us as well. Stephanie, you wanna fill in some more detail? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. We're seeing both buckets increase and we want to see the charity care increase above seeing the bad debt increase, right? And everybody, you know, I really don't think this has an impact to our bottom line. I really think if we can get um, more charity care, it's really just going to come from that bad debt line and have a zero, you know, effect on our PL. So we would absolutely love to see that. But right now we're seeing increases in both. And increases in both does have a bit of an impact um, to your overall bottom line and profitability. And so I think, you know, I don't have I don't have a great answer other than to say, you know, I really do think that some people personally haven't financially recovered from COVID, right? Whether there was a loss of 
employment or, or you know, whatever the, the case may be, I really think that we are seeing, um, you know, folks have not really recovered personally um, from the last few years, and that's really showing up. And so they probably deferred that health care for a long time and can't defer it anymore. And now they're receiving that health care and they really, truly don't have the means and the resources. So we're just trying to strike the right balance as an organization between, um, you know, providing the resources to get them pointed in the right place to get them help. We've got you know, our staff not only doing the financial counseling, but they're also those um, trained, you know, certified um, on the exchange, you know, whatever that title is, you guys know what I'm talking about. They're they're trained in helping folks get those Medicaid applications done and um, getting health insurance through the exchange. So what else can we do to provide support? Because I think what we're seeing really is just a bit of a lag in, um, you know, the the day-to-day -day struggle of some of the folks in Vermont. Navigators. Uh, navigator, <laughs> certified, <laughs> certified insur health insurance navigator or something like that. You're right. Yeah, no worries. Um, does that cover you, uh, Mr. Peich? Anything else you wanted to ask? Looks like maybe we're having a little technical difficulty. Um, Eric. Eric, you're on mute. Technical difficulties. Um, he just froze. Uh, but that is all our questions. I mean, I, I think just one comment is for Stephanie. I think, you know, we're, our office is interested in the um, kind of figuring out the underlying processes and the path towards free care. And so I kind of have a, a gut reaction to the it's a patient, like, right? I mean, I think it is partially, but like, if I have a $5,000 bill or a $1,000 bill, like the, the kind of underlying premise of that is, I don't care. And so I think, you know, most people care and I'm, you know, you know, most people care about a quarter of their monthly salary, right? Like, I just don't find it plausible, but I am interested, and I think this all partially aligns with lean thinking, is how do we optimize the processes and the pathways that cause that? And I think that's been a consistent process that we've been interested in. Um, and I think Rutland has done a really good job of, um, or their staff member has done a good job of looking at that. So I think that is something we'd like to address. Your ratio is honestly, it's one of the worst in the state. Um, and I think we see that trending towards being worse and worse and worse after the you reach the high point, um, I think in 2021. So I think that is a process that we could look at and should look at because it's it's trending in the wrong direction. But again, I want to echo Sam's statement is we we really appreciate how close you've come to the guidance this year. And it is, I think, worth pointing out that you guys were the sole Vermont hospital that came at guidance last year, if my memory serves. Thank you. Yeah, I Thank completely you. agree with you. And I think, um, you know, when we talk about, you know, can we get these patients to engage with us more? I, I couldn't agree with you more. People are going to fill out a piece of paper if that piece of paper is worth thousands of dollars to them. And so I think where we do a bad job explaining it is what, what we really mean is, we think that we are advertising it well with like signage and what's on the website and with the counselor at the front of the house, but still somehow the message to the patients isn't getting delivered because I do agree with you. If they knew about it, they would do it. And so if there's um, someone, you folks, Rutland, you know, that we can talk to and work with about, you know, how did you change the level of awareness to actually change the results? That's the piece where I just feel stuck and would love to to collaborate with folks. Let yeah, me I think reach our, out. Our... Oh, Sorry, go, go ahead, ahead Mr. Wright. I was no, just, just going to say, oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we both said go ahead. Um, 
I, I would agree with that. And I mean, I think it's a, you know, we don't know the answer, obviously, to how do you create a system that works? And it's exceedingly complicated. And I, I kind of think it's, uh, you know, somewhat of a trial and error, but I am interested in, you know, I think the knowledge share um, and how that occurs in Vermont is, is something that you guys are working on. And I think has been a longstanding wish of mine or hope. And I think, you know, to the extent that we can facilitate it around free care, we'd love to, and I'll write down a note and reach out and um, see what we can do, Stephanie. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You know, this is a great high reliability lean daily management project for us. It's obviously an area where we're not strong. And if we haven't been able to figure out through our own internal improvement process, then we are more than than wide open to learning from others. Um, I think it's something that, you know, Vermont hospitals do really well is share best practices. But I agree with you. I'm not sure that w while Rutland may be doing it better, I'm not sure we do it well as a system anywhere yet. And so, um, but anything we can do to improve the numbers, we're certainly up for. Will do. All right, sorry about your technical difficulty there, Mr. Peich. Any other questions you'd like to ask? Yeah, sorry about that. It was not my intention to ask a question and then ghost uh, my computer just <laughs> shut down. Um, I just wanted to, I don't know if this will be covered by the board, um, but I, I I heard, I believe correctly, that Northwestern, you wanted to talk in executive session on Medicare Advantage plans, and I had a couple of questions related to that. So I wasn't sure if there was a process for that, but just wanted to um, bring that up again. No, we didn't have a necessarily a desire to proactively talk about that, but I know that the board has had some questions. And so if the board has questions in that realm, we would just ask to go into executive session. Nothing else from us then. Thank you. Um, before we maybe entertain that uh, eventuality, just uh, making sure we're all ticked and tied here. Uh, the final rule had three tenths of a percent increase for Medicare IPS between the perspective and final. Just wondering uh, if that had any uh, material uh, effect to your budget. Yeah, so for us, that's worth just over, just a little over $100,000. So um, not material, but I understand that that's real money. I would say um, what has me very worried on the other side of the coin is the Medicaid redeterminations. Um, and I, that question's probably coming next, so I can wait if you don't want me to go there, Sarah. <laughs> Perfect segue. Have at it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we did not budget anything specifically for those Medicaid redeterminations. Again, not knowing like those patients are going to go somewhere. Are they going to go on some sort of a commercial plan and it will actually be better? Are they going to be true self-pay? Are they, you know, not knowing um, it just felt like we couldn't take an educated guess. And if I can't take an educated guess, I don't want to put it in the budget. So um, so I think that there's a little bit of money there on the Medicare side, but I'm really worried about the potential of the Medicaid side. Understandable. Okay. Uh, I think that covers all the staff questions. Uh, we Please think we've heard from the advocate. Any other board questions or uh, further business related to this hearing? I may have missed it in the submission, and so my apologies, but could you speak a little bit about ACO participation in the coming year? Yeah, the ACO, so we've budgeted to be a participant in the ACO in this budget uh, when we put it together a couple of months ago. There are some things that have changed, to be honest, since then. And so we're in a dialogue with the ACRO right now uh, and our board of directors um, about the fate of our participation. So in, in, in all good consciousness, I can't tell you one way or the other, but it is part of the budget. Uh, any other board member questions or comments for Northwestern? Okay. Um, I may have a question on <clears throat> the MA issues, uh, but first I'll take any public comment via the raise your hand function.
Okay, uh, seeing none. Um, so, Mr. Wright, I'm not sure how familiar you and your team are with this process, but I need to ask some questions first before we can go into executive session. Um, I would have to make a motion. And so, uh, I, I need to ask you, what I'm going to ask you about is some of the details relating to the payer shift to MA and some of the impacts that that's having on your business and some of the uh, negotiations and, and work you're doing with the MAs around the, the Medicare Advantage plans around those issues. Uh, so the first question I have is whether or not you believe those questions, the answers to those questions would, uh, uh, the premature general public knowledge of those issues would cause you a uh, substantial disadvantage with respect to your negotiations. Uh, thank you, Chair Foster. We do believe uh, that that would have a negative impact on us and, and would request a, a more appropriate venue to discuss them. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, and will... before, you, before you make the next motion, uh, there's another topic that I think uh, potentially could be added to executive session, which is uh, I think having more detailed information about the contract negotiations with the ACO program would be helpful information to have. So I will ask you, Mr. Wright, if having premature general public knowledge of those negotiations might uh, negatively impact Northwestern's ability uh, in that negotiation. I believe it would, Ms. Lynch. Thank you. Okay. Back to you, Owen. Sure. No, thank you. Um, so I'll move that we find that premature general public knowledge of uh, Northwestern's negotiations and work with Medicare Advantage plans and negotiations with the ACO uh, would put uh, Northwestern at a, uh, a substantial disadvantage with respect to its negotiations with the ACO and Medicare Advantage plans. I second that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously. Aye. Um, the next motion I would make is that we move into executive session under 1 VSA uh, 313A1 to consider Northwestern Medical Center's uh, negotiations with Medicare Advantage plans and also uh, with the ACO. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, so the motion carries unanimously. Um, we will resume um, the hospital budget hearing on Northwestern Medical Center. I think we have gone through all board member questions, public comment, HCA, and um, have we? And we did closings, so I think we are all set. Is that correct? Am I missing anything? I'm not sure we quite gave an opportunity for a closing remark, so we can probably do that and call it a meeting. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, then we will do so. Mr. Wright, um, please go ahead. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for your time, um, your encouragement, and the great questions that you asked. Um, uh, like other hospitals, it's a challenging environment, um, but you know we're very proud of the budget that we put forward. We feel it's responsible. We came close to the guidance as best we could while maintaining what we hope is our fiduciary responsibility to our organization and community um, and keeping our patients and our staff at the forefront of everything that we do. So thank you very much for your service. We appreciate this time to talk to you about our budget today um, and look forward to any follow-up questions that you may have. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Stephanie, Mr. Wright, and Mr. Batchelder. Uh, Ms. Is it Brielle? Is, is that how you pronounce your last name? Brielle? Lots bro. of unnecessary letters. It's just bro. Bro. Great. Well, thank you, Ms. Bro. <laughs> Um, so we will adjourn uh, at this time.